Hello everyone and thank you very much for attending this lecture. Uh, my name is Francesco Tacchino and today we will discuss about trainability issues for parameterized quantum machine learning models and possible strategies to mitigate them. Uh, so as we uh, discussed in a previous lecture, there is a very popular class of quantum machine learning models uh, that we generally call uh, quantum neural networks. Now, from a formal point of view, quantum neural networks are essentially parameterized quantum circuits whose layered structure and functionalities are in some sense similar or inspired by classical neural networks. Quantum neural networks are typically adaptively trained, namely the parameters appearing in the model are iteratively changed in order to obtain a desired outcome, such as, for example, learning how to compute some specific function of the inputs. Uh, although these models are conceptually simple and potentially very powerful, they also have some hidden flaws. And in fact, it was recently pointed out that in particular, the training of these models might be a little bit less straightforward than what one may think. Uh, this therefore leads potentially to some hidden costs, which might uh, hinder the advantages that these models are believed to bring, for example, with respect to conventional classical methods. Uh, what we will do in this lecture is uh, essentially the following. We will start by reviewing how, let's say, historically researchers have detected and interpreted some of these issues over the last few years. And in the second part of the lecture, we will mention a few possible strategies that have been recently proposed uh, while trying to cure or at least mitigate the impact of this phenomena on quantum neural networks and their applications. Uh, Okay, let's begin by taking a step back for a moment and let's have a look at the big picture. So what do we mean in general when we say we want to solve a problem by using a parameterized quantum circuit? Uh, well, the workflow is essentially the one that, that I'm showing on this slide. So imagine that you have some specific problem, maybe an optimization task or the analysis of a chemical system that you would like to solve with a variational quantum algorithm. Uh, now, the first thing that you have to do is to find a way of encoding this problem into a parameterized circuit model. Uh, this means that uh, uh, typically you have to take some input variables to be uploaded in the algorithm, uh, build a quantum circuit uh, with some adjustable degrees of freedom, and design a suitable cost function that will represent the solution to your problem. Uh, during the learning phase, you will then adapt uh, your parameters of the circuit with the aim of, for example, minimizing this cost function, which measures typically the distance from the ideal target solution that you would like to achieve. Uh, now, this final solution could be, for example, uh, directly the set of trained parameters, but in other case, it could be uh, the state prepared by the trained quantum circuit itself, or some carefully designed observable that you can reconstruct on such state. Now, in all cases, a crucial step is, of course, the way you design the structure for your parameterized quantum circuit. Now, uh, there are a few lucky instances in which this design step can follow an educated guess approach. So this happens, for example, when you have some knowledge about the properties or structure of the specific problem that you're dealing with. Uh, this happens uh, as an example when you try to solve problems in chemistry or physics. Uh, the direct connection to the problem will help you design an answer which can, for example, explore uh, only some relevant regions of the Hilbert space, and you may even have a hint towards the right direction where to go to find these solutions. Uh, think, for example, in this case, to add variational quantum eigensolver applications in chemistry, where you use couple cluster methods or you use a reference Hartree-Fock calculation as your initial guess. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the educated guess approach is not always possible. And in fact, the most common situation is uh, one in which we take a, a so-called heuristic approach. Uh, now, there are two main reasons why you would like, to, you may want to use heuristic structure for your parameterized quantum circuit. Uh, one is a very practical reason and justifies uh, the other name that is often used to refer to these strategies, which is hardware efficient ansatzes. Uh, now, if you would like to implement your algorithm directly on quantum hardware, and 
at some point you will always want to do this uh, uh, to demonstrate that your algorithm is working, uh, you have to face a number of technical difficulties, for example, limited connectivity between, between your qubits or a hard limit on the circuit depth that you can run with sufficient accuracy. Uh, this will mean that, for example, you may not be able in practice to directly apply the ideal solution you will have in mind, even for the structure problem case, because, for example, the resulting circuit might be too complex. So the heuristic approach is essentially to build parameterized structure which obey some practical constraints. For example, uh, only nearest neighbors uh, connectivity for entangling operations but which still have the ability, at least in principle, to explore large portions of the Hilbert space where you hope that the solution to your problem is located. Uh, now, these circuits will typically have very little structural relations or connections with the particular problem that you are actually trying to solve, and this has both advantages and disadvantages. The main advantage is, of course, that you don't need to know in principle anything specific about the, your problem, so you could ideally put very little effort in understanding all the details of it. Uh, of course, uh, the world would be a much easier place if all problems could be solved efficiently in this way, and this should already be a warning. Uh, anyway, uh, it might be the case that, for example, the hidden structure or the symmetries that you may want to use for an educated guess are precisely part of the solution that you are trying to, to achieve, and in this case, uh, uh, the heuristic approach is very much appealing. Uh, however, uh, because this heuristic approach is essentially blind to where the solution might be and what would be a good direction to approach it, the hardness of the training might in fact become the dominant cost here. Uh, so when we say solving a problem with parameterized quantum circuits and variational optimization, what we have in mind is essentially this. So you design a quantum circuit uh, with a qubit register uh, on which you implement a few parameterized unitary operations, and on the end, you build the cost function by measuring something. So uh, the idea is the, uh, that you have some initial reference state, you have a parameterized unitary operation that represents your circuit, and then you will have an observable that we will call O for the rest of this lecture. Uh, with these three ingredients, you can construct the cost function for your optimization problem. Uh, then what you do typically is to use this parameterized quantity in combination with, for example, some classical optimization routine that you may run on your classical laptop. And at every step of the computation, this optimization routine receives the current value of the cost function and suggests a new set of parameters to be used in the next step. So you go on with the computation and uh, at some point you will ultimately reach uh, a minimum for the cost function, for example. Uh, notice that by changing the parameters, what you do is that essentially you are exploring an optimization landscape aiming for a global minimum. Now, the properties of this optimization landscape will crucially depend, of course, on the structure of the parameterized quantum circuits and on the way you define the cost function. Uh, particularly when you use uh, heuristic approaches to solve the problem, you may incur in the unpleasant phenomenon of vanishing gradients, which is giving the title to this slide. So, uh, in this lecture, I will use this term gradients to refer essentially to one thing, the derivatives of the cost function with respect to, to the parameters. Uh, these gradients are very helpful quantities to characterize the properties of the optimization landscape. And uh, notice that uh, the fact that we talk about gradients does not implicitly mean that we will use or we have in mind to use gradient based optimization methods, but simply that we want to understand how the loss landscape is structured. Uh, this structure, as you know very well, if you ever work even with classical optimization problems, we have a big impact on the performances that you can achieve both with gradient based and gradient free methods. Uh, now, you can easily understand that vanishing gradients are a problem for optimization because the flatter the loss landscape is, the more difficult it is to make effective moves in this space, namely to get a feeling of where the minimum might be located. Uh, just for a comparison, imagine uh, uh, the difference between trying to reach the bottom of a valley where you are out for a hike in the mountains compared to finding a hole in a golf court. Of course, when there is no 
flag indicating its position. Uh, so in many practical situations, you will find yourself with the following ingredients, uh, particularly when you use uh, hardware efficient or uh, heuristic ansatzes. So you will have a random parameterized quantum circuit, which at least initially you will have to make deep enough to explore a large part of the Hilbert space, since you don't really know where uh, the uh, solution might be located. Uh, 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 for example, say you have to use a depth which scales polynomially in the number of qubits. You will also need to give uh, initial values to the many parameters in the circuits, and if you don't really have a clue or a particular insight on where to start, you might very well be tempted to initialize them with random values. Now, these two ingredients here are, uh, in a way, a perfect recipe for the disaster. Uh, in fact, uh, these two conditions are already sufficient uh, for the issue of vanishing gradients to arise. So, in a few words, uh, what you will typically observe is that, on average, the gradients of your cost function will vanish, like indicated here, and most importantly, the variance of these gradients will be exponentially small with the number of qubits that you use. So, uh, uh, in a few words, uh, this, effect, this means that the optimization landscape that you are trying to navigate is becoming flatter and flatter, which leads us to the other name that we give to this phenomenon, namely the emergence of barren plateaus. Uh, notice that uh, the fact that this is occurring as a function of the size of the problem is precisely uh, suggesting that a strong question mark uh, must be uh, taken into account when uh, we consider scalability of these methods to regimes, for example, where a few tens or hundreds of qubits are, uh, are used. And this is actually precisely the regime where we hope for practical quantum advantages. Uh, now, let me also mention that from a mathematical point of view, the emergence of barren plateaus is related to the fact that random quantum circuits quickly approximate the so-called two designs. Uh, which are random circuits matching the hard distribution over unitaries up to the second statistical moment. And essentially, as we will see, uh, as soon as the circuit is comp complex enough to approach this two design limit, the mean and variance of the cost function gradients will show this barren plateau characteristics. Uh, now, before going on, let me also clarify uh, another point. Uh, and this is that although we will mostly consider in this lecture heuristic quantum circuits, there is actually no formal guarantee that the issue of vanishing gradients will not arise also in some, at least some more structured problem instances. But uh, uh, depending on what uh, precisely you mean by structured problem, uh, this uh, phenomenon might be a little bit less likely to happen, or uh, it might be possible to fix it in, a, in an easier way. Uh, so, from an historical perspective, barren plateaus were in fact originally detected and studied first on heuristic settings. So, this will be the situation that we will consider for most of the time. Uh, so, uh, as I said, let's start with a brief history of how these issues were discovered, tested, and rationalized over the last few years. Now, essentially, the first work that described the barren plateaus in quantum circuit was this paper by McLean and collaborators in 2018. So here the authors discovered and proved, based on some, con some concentration of measure effects, that whenever your random parameterized circuits are deep enough, and by deep here that we mean that essentially uh, they contain a number of layer, which is a polynomial function of the number of qubits, uh, then you will most probably incur into the vanishing gradients problem. Uh, so to be, to be a little bit more explicit, let's see an example. Uh, uh, let's start from some initial reference state, for example, that we may prepare with some fixed qubit operations and build uh, an ansatz, uh, an hardware heuristic ansatz, by putting together a number of layers where each layer is composed, for example, by a set of parameterized single qubit rotations. Mm, for example, their axis can be chosen at random between X, Y, or Z, plus uh, entang entangling blocks like this uh, made of a set of fixed uh, nearest neighbors quantum operations, like, for example, control Z gates. Uh, of course, you can make this circuit more and more complex by increasing the number of layers. And of course, we'll, this will also increase the number of parameters that you have in your answers. Uh, 
we can also define a cost function uh, for this problem. For example, say that we observe the expectation value of the product of sigma z operators on the first two qubits. Now, what happens if we take one of the parameters which are around in our circuit and we compute the gradient for the cost function with respect to this parameter? Uh, well, uh, in this plot here that you see at the top, uh, you will see that the variance of this gradient decreases exponentially with the number of qubits. Uh, uh, this happens uh, if while we increase the number of qubits, we also increase the depth of the circuit with a polynomial law. For example, say that the number of layers is always 10 times the number of qubits. Uh, in this uh, other picture at the bottom, uh, the authors report that for different number of qubits, uh, how many layers you need in general to approach the two design limit. So the, the limit in which the variance of the gradient saturates to an exponentially small value, which depends on the number of qubits. Uh, so uh, in this picture, in particular, the number of qubits increases from top to bottom. Uh, and uh, 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 so you see that uh, uh, the number of layers that you need in order to approach the two design limit is a little bit larger in absolute terms when you increase the number of qubits, but you will also reach it in essentially a polynomial number of steps. Uh, a similar set of, result of, of results, like the one that we show here, are also valid if instead of local cost functions, uh, which involve a fixed subset of qubits, uh, we use a fidelity type of cost function, like this one, uh, where we essentially measure how close we are to a global uh, reference and qubit state. Uh, now, this actually brings us to a very important point that we need to discuss. So, uh, what the paper by McLean and collaborator taught us is that uh, barren plateaus arise in deep heuristic parameterized quantum circuits for the case of a global cost function, in which, for example, the observable that we use involves all the qubits in the circuit, uh, but also uh, uh, for local cost functions. Remember the first example that we analyzed, where uh, the cost function is uh, reconstructed by uh, observing only one or more subsets of qubits at a time, uh, but the size of these assist subsystems does not increase even when we increase the total size of the quantum register. Now, this leaves us, uh, leaves us with the open question regarding what happens uh, in, if we go towards the more shallow circuits. So uh, we can ask uh, actually the following question. Can we mitigate or hope to avoid barren plateaus by simply using shallower circuits? Uh, now, the answer uh, came re recently, uh, was published with uh, this other work by Cerezo and collaborators, and the outcome is that the role of the cost function here becomes crucial. So, uh, on one hand, uh, the situation is completely hopeless if we use global cost functions. Uh, uh, in fact, barren plateaus can occur across the whole spectrum of circuit depths. However, the combination of local cost functions and shallow circuits gives a little bit of hope. In fact, uh, Cerezo and co-workers demonstrated that it is, uh, for a fairly general choice of your heuristic ansatz called the alternating layered ansatz, if you use a local cost function, you can find a lower bound uh, for the variance of, of your gradients, and these lower bounds depend crucially on the number of qubits uh, and on a few other parameters of your circuits, including its, its, its total depth, with, which we call big L. Uh, so, if you keep this uh, total uh, depth uh, as a, to be a logarithmic function of the number of qubits, namely if you stick to a shallow circuit configuration, then this lower bound cannot vanish faster than polynomially in L. Uh, meaning uh, that the same must also be true for the variance of the gradient itself. So no barren plateau will be present in, in this situation. Uh, moreover, there is also a transition region here in between uh, where uh, the variance is vanishing faster than polynomially, but slower than exponentially. Okay, uh, we have been talking since the beginning of this lecture about plateaus, but we never, really, never actually saw uh, or visualized this phenomenon in concrete terms. And we can do it now with this example, which is again presented in the paper by Marco Cerezo and collaborators. Uh, let's say we have the following task. Uh, 
uh, we take a number of qubits n and we prepare these qubits in some initial state, let's say all of them in state zero. Uh, we want to design a parameterized quantum circuit which learns a variational implementation of the identity on this state. Uh, we will use, for example, a very simple ansatz, uh, which is made uh, only of single qubit rotations. Uh, and what we will do is uh, that we ask our parameterized quantum circuits to understand that all these rotation angles should be zero. Uh, and this will be our optimal point. Uh, we can choose a cost function with the typical structure that we introduced before. So initial state, uh, parameterized quantum circuit and observable. Uh, for this last uh, element, we can make two alternative choices here. Uh, one is essentially a global fidelity measure, like this one. Uh, uh, so uh, the, the, the we require that all qubits are simultaneously close to the desired output. In the other case, we can do something a little bit different and uh, uh, design a local version of the cost function, which only checks the fidelity of individual qubits at a time. Now, the two cost functions here have uh, the important property that the minimum uh, of, of both of them occur for the same conditions, name all the rotation angles should be zero. Uh, but the behavior of the gradients with respect to the parameters is actually very different. And in fact, we can prove uh, analytically that the variance of the global cost function is exponentially vanishing uh, in the number of qubits n, and this is a manifestation of a barren plateau, even for this very shallow kind of ansatz. Uh, on the other hand, the variance of the gradient in the case of a local cost function is only polynomially vanishing in N, like here. So I promised you a visualization, so, so here is how this looks like in practice. Now, this is a cut in the global optimization landscape. Uh, and uh, so here on the left, you see the case for a global uh, cost function. And here on the right, you see the case for the local optimization landscape. So in the global case, you see that the solution of your problem is sitting here uh, uh, in a deep, narrow region within your optimization landscape. Uh, and this uh, narrow region becomes actually narrower and narrower the more qubits you add. Uh, uh, on top of this, the landscape is uh, uh, mostly flat in all other places. So essentially, you have to be very lucky at the very beginning to find yourself in a region, in this region here. Uh, where the gradients are not zero and your optimization can at least get a, a suggestion on what the right direction towards the minimum could be. Uh, everywhere else, you might simply end up wandering around at random, uh, essentially uh, doing not better than random guessing. Uh, so this region here at the top is precisely what a barren plateau looks like. Uh, on the other hand, when you use local cost function for the same problem, you see that the optimization landscape is much nicer. Uh, in particular, uh, it has no big flat regions, and wherever you are, you will always be able, essentially almost always be able, to find a minimum meaningful direction that brings you towards the minimum, which is sitting here uh, at the bottom of, uh, 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 so in a place where it's not surrounded by big flat regions. Uh, so uh, we can also have a look now at a little bit more advanced example, in particular a variational quantum autoencoder. Uh, now quantum autoencoders are by themselves a classical, a, a class of interesting quantum machine learning applications. Uh, and uh, I will not describe their, all their details here, but if you're interested, you can find these details, for example, in this publication. Uh, in brief, the goal of this quantum autoencoder is to take uh, uh, an input quantum state defined on a few qubits and to compress it on a number of qubits, which is smaller than the original one. Now, the idea is that you can store the relevant information, for example, here on these qubits and uh, transmit few qubits, for example, through a communication channel and later recover the original state with a decoder. Now, a natural way of doing uh, this is to find a variational parameterized circuit uh, which decouples, say, the B subsystem here that we want to discard from the state that we want to transmit. Uh, and this can be done, for example, by bringing all the qubits in the B subsystem into a simple reference state that we can later easily reprepare uh, uh, to decode the state with an operation, the decoder, which will be essentially the inverse of the encoding one. 
Now, for this example, which again comes from the paper by Sereso and collaborators, we will use an heuristic ansatz of this form, which is constructed with single qubit parameterized rotations alternated with fixed entangling gates. Uh, now, let's say that the target subsystem in which we want to save or to store or compress the relevant information is made of a single qubit, this one which is labeled with A. Uh, of course, the state that we want to compress in this case is simple enough that the relevant information can in fact be stored on this single qubit. Uh, the system B that we want to discard will be a collection of n other qubits that we will increase in number while keeping the overall depth of the circuit uh, sufficiently shallow. Uh, now, the cost function uh, has, uh, again, the usual structure that we uh, have defined also in previous cases, and this time it measures the compression, the degree of compression that we are able to achieve. Uh, this can be, again, either a global fidelity measure on the state of subsystem B, like here, or a local version of it. Uh, now, uh, in this plot here, you can see what happens to the cost function uh, over several iterative, iterative optimization steps in both cases, so for global and local uh, cost functions. In the global case, which is the one reported here on the top, uh, what you see is that uh, uh, you will be able to train well if the subsystem B is small, uh, for example, in this uh, part here that I highlighted. Uh, and you can see this by the fact that the cost function value decreases as you proceed with the optimization. Uh, however, as soon as you increase the number of qubits in B, uh, there will be this uh, flat region that appears, for example, here, uh, where the cost function remains constant over many iterations of your optimization routine. Uh, uh, and in the end, the value will completely flatten out like here, meaning that we are exploring a flat region where wherever we do, whatever we do with the parameters, we are never able to decrease the value of the cost function. So here, essentially, we are sitting on a barren plateau, and you see uh, very nicely that this uh, essentially starts to become a problem, for example, uh, here with 15 qubits, uh, and becomes a more serious one with 20 qubits, and after this, you are in practice unable to train your model anymore in all these cases here. Uh, however, by just switching from a global to a local cost function, which still encodes the, so has the same meaning in terms of representing the solution of the problem, uh, we see that we will all, we are always able to train the model, like in this, even for very large dimensions of system B, like here. Okay, uh, so far uh, we have introduced the problem and, and explored a few situations in which we have the manifestation of barren plateaus. Uh, now, uh, what is quite interesting to do is to have a look to other related results from the literature that specialize these concepts uh, to some other popular quantum neural network models. Uh, now, some of these models were already mentioned in one of the previous lectures, so uh, I will be very quick in describing their design and I will mostly concentrate on how bar and plateau affect them. Uh, so let's start, for example, from dissipative quantum neural networks. Now, these are very general machine learning models that are designed to achieve, for example, universal quantum computation capabilities, and they are based uh, on a quantum perceptron structure. So, essentially, quantum perceptrons link two layers of the network, like here, and these uh, two layers are represented by separate registers of qubits. Uh, the input register, for example, is loaded with some state uh, that you have it prepared either from uh, the, at the beginning of your computation or from a previous layer, and the other fresh register is initialized in some reference state, and this will become the output of the perceptron. Uh, the connection between the two layers is a, a set of controlled unitary operations involving input and output qubits. Uh, we can actually uh, distinguish the following situations. Uh, uh, so, uh, if all the input qubits, uh, so the qubits uh, in the input register, are actively involved in uh, all operations targeting a given output qubit, we will call this a global perceptron. Uh, on the other hand, local perceptrons are designed in such a way that only a subset of the qubits in the input register uh, will act upon a given qubit in the output register, and the size of this subset does not increase with the overall size of the network. Now, as you can easily imagine, 
the presence of local perceptrons essentially puts a limit on how fast the information can spread into your quantum network. Uh, the usual task that you would like to accomplish with dissipative quantum neural networks is, for example, for a given input state to learn a transformation into some specific output state, psi out. Uh, as a result, the typical observable that you use to build the cost function for dissipative quantum neural networks is something of, of this kind. So again, a fidelity type of measure, which checks the overlap or similarity of the network output uh, with the desired output state. Uh, now, this can again be done globally, like in many previous examples, but if you're lucky enough that uh, your uh, output, uh, desired output has a tensor product uh, structure, so it's a tensor product of local states on the output qubits, uh, you can define again a local version of the cost function which checks the local fidelities one qubit at a time. Now, in this paper, which is referenced here at the bottom, uh, uh, the general results for barren plateaus have been specialized to dissipative quantum neural networks. And in particular here, uh, both the architecture that you use, that you use to build your, uh, your uh, dissipative neural network and the structure of the cost function will have an impact on the trainability of this class of models. Uh, you may, for example, choose deep or shallow networks, uh, local or global perceptrons, as we just saw, uh, and of course, global or local cost functions. Uh, now, if you use deep circuits, for example, global perceptrons and global cost, then you will most probably uh, incur in the issue of barren plateaus. Uh, the same is also true even if you use shallow circuits and local perceptrons, uh, but still a global cost function. So this is uh, very similar to what happens in general parametrized quantum circuits, that whenever you use a global cost function, you typically have trainability issues. Uh, however, uh, just like in the general case, the, usual, the, the use of local cost functions is helpful. But in this case, only if you combine this with shallow uh, circuits and local perceptrons. Uh, so, essentially, in addition to the usual requirements, uh, for example, the use of shallow circuits, you have to take into account the uh, design constraint of using local perceptrons. Okay, uh, now a, a, another very popular model that we saw in previous lectures is uh, quantum convolutional neural networks. Uh, so, as you probably know, convolutional neural networks were developed classically precisely to address trainability problems. And interestingly enough, they are also helpful in the quantum case. Uh, so uh, let's recall briefly what a quantum convolutional neural network uh, is. Uh, this is uh, a model uh, where you, which is inspired by the structure of classical convolutional neural networks uh, and have convolutional layers like these ones in which you apply essentially the same kind of local unitary transformations over subsets of qubits and you have pooling layers uh, where you decrease the dimensionality of your system by uh, measuring some of the qubits and using the classical information that you acquire to control quantum operations on the remaining qubits. Uh, now, a very important aspect of convolutional neural networks is that they can have very few parameters. And this is partly because of the dimensionality reduction and in part due to the correlations that one can establish, for example, between operations in convolutional layers. So, uh, in this paper here that uh, uh, I again encourage you to check if you want to get more details, it was actually proven that the variance of the gradients for convolutional neural networks can, again, can uh, be lower bounded by a quantity, uh, which depends again on the number of qubits and on the number of layers that you have in your network and uh, other properties of the model. Uh, what is important, however, is that uh, because of the fact that you have, uh, for example, pooling layers and possibly translationally invariant unitaries in convolutional layers, the actual depth of quantum convolutional neural networks is naturally shallow. So you can usually assume that the number of layers is a logarithmic function of, uh, of the number of qubits, essentially by design, and so this gradient does not vanish faster than polynomially uh, in the size of the quantum register. Now, a few other interesting consequences uh, were presented in the same work. The first one is that a quantum convolutional neural network made only of pooling layers, so fixing all the convolutional layers to be trivial identity operations, is also trainable. 
Uh, a second interesting observation is that by adding correlations between the parameters in the network, you get larger gradients. And this for, was, for example, tested uh, in this particular example by comparing the variance of gradients uh, when the parameters for unitary operations in convolutional layers are either independent or correlated. Uh, the result is that, uh, as you can see, for example, here, uh, you can, in fact, gain a bit in the correlated case compared to the uncorrelated one. Uh, okay, we will, in fact, get back to this idea of correlations between parameters in a moment uh, when we will start discussing possible strategies to mitigate barren plateaus. But before going there, uh, uh, let me mention another kind of barren plateaus, which is conceptually a little bit different from what we have discussed so far. So uh, you know it, with that when you design a parameterized variational algorithm, uh, 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 but in general, I would say for n equal to magnet, you have not only to take care about, uh, to, to care about its mathematical properties, but you also have to deal with the effect of hardware noise if you really want to implement this algorithm on a near term noisy processor, for example. Uh, so in the case of, para of parameterized quantum circuits, uh, uh, we, we have to understand what happens uh, to the optimization landscape when noisy quantum operations are performed. So you may probably remember that uh, it was generally believed that, for example, adapt adaptive strategies like we have for parameterized quantum circuit could show some noise resilience compared, for example, to exact quantum algorithms like the quantum Fourier transform or quantum phase estimation. Uh, however, the effect of noise can also lead to the emergence of some form of barren plateaus. And uh, uh, so they, they make, uh, make the training of your algorithm a bit harder. Uh, this, will be, this, this noise induced barren plateau will essentially be an effect related uh, more to the ANSATS depth than to the ANSATS structure. So we will not need any particular reference to the structured or heuristic nature of such ANSATS. Uh, now, an interesting set of results were derived uh, in this work here that I'm referencing at the bottom uh, uh, by assuming a simple noise model of this kind. So we assume that uh, before and after every layer in our quantum convolutional, in our convol uh, quantum neural network, each qubit is uh, subject to local Pauli noise with some strength that we call Q, for example. Uh, a first consequence of this uh, scenario is that the cost function values will start to concentrate around the value corresponding to a maximally mixed state, uh, which is essentially the one uh, in which all the information is washed out by noise. Uh, more precisely, this, this concentration will happen exponentially in the number of layers, big L, uh, that you have in your circuit, and is controlled by the noise strength value. Uh, consequence number two, uh, we have a bound on the gradient of the cost function, which is again exponentially small in the number of layers. Uh, essentially, this means that when L is large enough, for example, uh, a polynomial in function of the number of qubits, this quantity that bounds the magnitude of the gradient will be exponentially vanishing in the number of qubits that you have in the quantum neural network. And this is what essentially we may call a noise-induced barren plateau. Uh, moreover, if on top of the noise affecting the unitary operations, you also take into account that you may have some measurement noise, for example, some local bit flip channels on your qubits with a strength that we call QM, then the situation is even a bit worse. So on top of the exponentially vanishing quantity uh, F of N uh, the, that, that uh, uh, we described before, that will, there will also be an additional factor controlled by QM, which is also exponentially vanishing in this variable W, which is essentially a measure of the locality of the observable that we use in the cost function. Uh, so uh, for noise-induced barren plateaus, the usual strategy of switching from a global to a local, local cost function uh, will only be able to uh, partially mitigate the problem. Uh, now, let me stress better a point that is very important and maybe was a bit hidden uh, in the previous slide. So there is actually a very fundamental conceptual difference between noise-free barren plateaus that we described at the beginning of the lecture and, the, and these noise-induced barren plateaus. In fact, 
the defining feature of noise-free barren plateaus is that the variance of the cost function gradients vanishes exponentially in the number of qubits. Uh, this means typically that the minimum of the cost function will still be located somewhere in your optimization landscape, uh, but it will sit in a very narrow region surrounded by the barren plateau, and the deep becomes exponentially narrower for larger systems. Uh, contrary to this, noise-induced barren plateaus uh, uh, do not have an effect on the variance of the gradient, but directly on the magnitude of the gradient. Uh, this means that the whole optimization landscape is getting flatter and flatter when you increase the circuit depth. So, for example, here on the left, you can see what happens, uh, uh, for example, uh, when you increase the number of qubits and layers. Uh, and this is, uh, again, a cut in the uh, optimization landscape. So, in this case, you will not be able, uh, you will, uh, so you will not be able to easily find a minimum since the minimum itself is going to, to disappear ultimately, uh, and the cost function will approach the featureless landscape determined by maximally mixed states. Okay, so uh, this concludes this part of the lecture, and we are now ready to explore uh, a few possible strategies to mitigate barren plateaus. So since we just discussed this topic, uh, uh, let me also remark that we will concentrate for the remainder of this lecture on how to mitigate noise-free barren plateaus. Uh, now, as usual, uh, there have been several proposals and no ultimate strategy is known so far. Uh, so what we will do now is that we will review a few possibilities. And of course, you are more than welcome, first of all, to go again in the literature and check for the details of these implementations or to find other ones. But if you like the subject, uh, you are also very welcome to engage in the quest for new solutions, of course. So, uh, okay, one possible option is to do layer-wise learning. Uh, Layer-wise learning, for example, in the context of quantum neural networks was proposed in this publication uh, listed here. So the idea is that you reduce the effective depth of the circuits that you train by starting with a very shallow circuit, say with only a couple of layers, uh, and you train this, this circuit at its best. Uh, then, uh, say, for example, you are not happy with the final outcome in general terms, in absolute terms, and this is most probably the case if the circuit is too shallow to find a good solution, you fix the parameters that you just trained in this first part, you add a few more layers, and you retrain again your model, but this time you only allow the new parameters uh, to vary, and maybe uh, uh, allow only a little fraction of the old ones to change as well. Uh, now, when you add new layers, for example, you may initialize uh, the parameters in the new layers uh, all to zero, for example, or in general, in such a way that the new layers uh, implement at the beginning a trivial identity operation, so that you have a smooth transition and the cost function will start from the best value achieved in the previous step. Uh, uh, now, when you are done with, uh, with the layer-wise learning, you can also retrain bigger portions of the circuit, like, for example, larger contiguous partitions of it, treating the fraction of the parameters that you allow to vary as a hyperparameter of your training. Now, in this figure, for example, taken from the paper uh, referenced at the bottom, you can see that uh, the so-called the LL curves, which means layer-wise learning, are... Mm, much better uh, in terms of performances compared to CDL curves, which means complete depth learning. And this is, for example, an example uh, taken from a NIST classification experiments with eight qubits. Uh, now, as part of the problem with barren plateau is, is precisely that we, don't, we do not usually know how to initialize the parameters in the very first step, another possible mitigation strategy is to find a good recipe for initialization. Uh, so, in other words, uh, 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 there is a way uh, to, uh, the, the question is, uh, is there a way to be sure that we not, do not start already on the plateau region? Uh, so, one possibility is uh, the following, which was proposed by Grant and collaborators in this work. Uh, now, the philosophy here is essentially that if you have this big parameterized quantum circuit that you would like to use, you first of all divide it into blocks and you initialize each block in such a way that it implements an identity operation. So say, for example, you randomly initialize a part of the parameters that you have inside the block, and you have to fix all the others uh, in such a way that the second part of the block uh, is the inverse of the first one. 
so this idea again limits the effective depth of your circuit uh, in such a way that the gradient with respect to most of the parameters will not be exponentially small, at least in the first training set. Uh, now, of course, this does not guarantee in principle that you will never creep again onto a plateau, uh, but at least it will ensure that you will be able to make a good first step at the beginning. Uh, finally, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we, can make you, make, we can make use of correlations, which are an important ingredient for increasing the man magnitude of your gradients. And now, this idea was explored uh, in some depth in this series of works that I encourage you to check. And as an example, if you use an answer of, this, of, the, of the form here, you can, for example, uh, correlate the angles that you use for different qubits in the same layer. Uh, uh, and if you do so, the, the gradients will generally become larger with respect to the fully uncorrelated case. And this, in fact, should remind you of convolutional layers in quantum convolutional neural networks. Uh, uh, the same is also true, for example, if you correlate the parameters uh, uh, in, in this other way, for example, by using uh, correlated parameters on each qubit across different layers. Uh, now, let me also mention that this is actually a part of a larger study on the relationship between accessibility gradients and bar and plateaus that you may want to have a look uh, in this works, uh, particularly this one, if you are interested. Uh, now, before leaving you, let me also mention very briefly some additional results and training strategies that you may want to have a look at. Uh, essentially, you can take this as a list of, of recommended readings uh, for your homeworks. So, it, it turns out that there is a deep relationship between bar and plateaus and entanglement, and uh, by studying it, uh, entanglement-aware bar and plateau mitigation strategies have also been devised. And you can find an example, for example, in this, in this work here. Uh, 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 classical methods has also, have also been demonstrated to become useful to assist quantum learning. For example, in this nice work on meta-learning or learning to learn, uh, where classical recurrent neural networks were integrated with quantum machine learning models, for example, to find good initialization heuristics for uh, the, the quantum models. Uh, finally, uh, you may also want to have a look at quantum unsampling strategies, uh, which are also interesting as they are closely related to the idea of using local versus, versus global fidelity measures to construct cost functions. Okay, uh, we are now at the end of the lecture. I hope that this was useful and I thank you all very much for your attention. Uh, have a nice day and goodbye.